last lecture of CAM 223. Uh, what we'll do in the remaining time we have is we're just going to go through some review slides for things for the second midterm. And again, like Jonah totally just uh, nailed, uh, this Wednesday night I'll release midterm two on the website, download it, print it off, and then submit it to me Friday morning, 9 o'clock by email, uh, just like the last one. The format of the midterm, very similar. 20 multiple choice questions, uh, three to four answer, short answer questions. I think the final number is four short answer questions, uh, but something like that. Um, and again, when you get it back, it'll probably be next week, Tuesday, because Monday is the holiday, but uh, Tuesday then your midterm will have a summary sheet at the end kind of saying how you're doing. Uh, to prepare for this midterm, I hope these questions will be helpful, but in addition, there's a sample midterm online. If you go to the quizzes and exams section on our website, there's actually a sample midterm too that I did a few years ago. There are um, some other like resources, sample quizzes and stuff like that. If you can't find any of this, man, you let me know and I'll totally help you find it and stuff. Emails are great. Any questions, that kind of stuff? All right, so these questions, what I'll do is I'll just uh, start them. I'll put them up for a little bit. If you'd like to work on them, try and figure an answer, that would be awesome. On the other hand, you just want to stare in space. That's what we'll do. I believe in osmosis learning just as much as anything. So these questions will be, we'll start with solubility, and they'll go through entropy and other thermodynamic things, and maybe if we have time, get into electrochemistry. So in this problem here, it says, think about if a precipitate will form when you add these reagents in pretty concentrated amounts, one mole per liter. Yes, no, who knows? And don't put down who knows unless you just have a great sense of humor, because there is going to be an answer here. solubility things from the solubility guide was how chloride, bromide, and iodide, they're almost always water soluble in Q, unless they're with silver plus, mercury 2, 2 plus, or lead 2 plus. And in this example, this is a source of chloride, the Cl minus. We don't care about potassium because it's a spectator. And this compound right here, nitrate, NO3 minus, is another spectator. But lead 2 plus is the dominant part. So when lead 2 plus mixes with any of these, it makes a solid. So we would absolutely see a solid here. Now this, comp this set right here is super important for us this week in lab. We're looking at the, what's called the qualitative analysis of group 1 ions. Group 1 ions are silver plus, lead 2 plus, and this mercury 2, 2 plus. So we will use the fact that all three of these make insoluble compounds when chloride is formed. Maybe we'll add HCl or NaCl instead of KCl, but if you add a source of chloride to one of these three, it will make a solid. And we'll see this in example a lot this week in the QA1 lab. Any questions? Now, here's a question. We have a solubility of barium fluoride, 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3. And it says, essentially, calculate KSP for barium fluoride using this information. So knowing that this is solubility, the X we talked about, see if you can figure out what KSP would be for this particular reaction. In this question, we're trying to think about how solubility and KSP are related.
All right, solubility is different than KSP. Like you can always take solubility and find KSP or take KSP and find solubility. Solubility, which is the number that's up there, is the moles per liter of barium fluoride that dissolve. So in this problem, X is usually what I refer to as solubility. So in this case, it's saying that 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of barium fluoride will dissolve per liter of solution. Now, to figure out what KSP is then, you can look at the ions that pop out. So for example, barium fluoride will create 1 mole of barium and 2 moles of fluoride. Or, if we had X moles of barium fluoride breaking up, you'd have X moles of barium 2 plus, and you'd have 2X for fluoride, because there's two F minuses for every barium 2 plus. And these X's are what you can use in the KSP. So the barium here in the KSP expression would be X, and fluoride would be 2X, but it has to be squared. So when you combine this, 2 squared is 4, and x squared times x is x to the cube. So in the lecture, I referred to this as a KSP equals 4x cubed type thing. x is the solubility, and KSP, of course, is the value you look up. You can almost always look up KSP values, but solubility sometimes is not there. There's other things you can do with KSP besides solubility. <clears throat> So one way to do this problem is to literally take this number and put it in there for x, all right? x to the third power times four will give you the answer. You could also take this number, multiply it by two and square it, and then multiply it by x again, and either way is fine. But when you do this, you should get 1.9 times 10 to the minus seven. <clears throat> Any chemical system which has, like in this case, two anions for every one cation, or two cations for every anion, any of these two to one systems will have KSP equals 4x cubed. So you can quickly go back and forth between solubility and KSP if you'd like to. So. Any questions? Okay. Solubility is different than KSP in the lab, uh, the calcium hydroxide lab really you're first finding hydroxide, and then you have to turn it into solubility. You divide it by two, if I remember right. So um, that's another way to kind of focus on the difference between the two. If you report to the city of Gresham in the environmental safety area, you're probably going to be more interested in solubility, all right, which is how many moles per liter will break down in water, stuff like that. On the other hand, there's a lot of other things you can do besides solubility. So that's why KSP values you can find tables of. Solubility is usually something you can calculate yourself. Okay. So here are three lead compounds. And lead is usually not super soluble. And we know that these three are all insoluble because they all have KSPs, equilibrium constants, less than one. Remember, every time you have a KSP, the solid is the reactant, and the ions that go into it are the products. So in this question, it says, which of these lead salts has the greatest solubility in water? So see if you can figure out which one of those would be the best answer.
this problem, all of these compounds have one lead and one counter ion. So carbonate is a polyatomic ion, CO3 minus 2, sulfide, S minus 2, and this is sulfate, SO4 minus 2. So all of these, you would write the lead compound on the left as a solid, and it would break up into lead 2 plus and whatever else the counter ion. So really in this problem, solubility, which again is the X value, uh, X moles of lead 2 carbonate are breaking up, and they break up into X moles of lead 2 plus and X moles of carbonate. So what it comes down to is that the relationship here between the solubility X and KSP, it's KSP equals X squared. If your compounds are one to one, one metal to one non-metal, one metal to one polyatomic ion, whatever, then X squared equals KSP. In the last one, it was a two to one ratio. That's why we use KSP equals four X cubed. So the ultimate way to do this problem was you would take the square root of KSP to solve for X. So if you wanted X by itself, X would equal KSP. And yes, I know the math is a little positive, negative, but in chemistry, it's always about positive uh, masses, positive moles per liter, stuff like that. Um, so that would be the ultimate way to do this problem. And the greatest solubility would be the greatest number. But you can maybe see, just based on math, that the biggest KSP will have the biggest solubility. These two are much, much, much smaller than this one is right here. So by hook or by crook, you can either take the square root of these numbers to see that the PBSO4 would be the biggest solubility, and that's totally fine. The largest KSP will give you the largest solubility. So in this case, it's definitely going to be PBSO4. This one would have the smallest solubility, so that's the least soluble of all of these three. All of these, you would see a solid if they form, but this one would have the least amount of solid per metal, if you will. Any questions on that? So here's a question. We have a source of carbonate, Excuse me, thanks for playing. We have a source of sulfite and a source of sulfate, all right? Sulfite is SO3, sulfate is SO4. And what we're gonna do is try and separate the sulfate from the sulfite, all right? So right now the concentrations are a little bit different, but they're both pretty close. And the goal here is we're gonna add some calcium, a source of calcium two plus. And why they're adding calcium is that calcium plus sulfite or sulfite makes an insoluble compound. So for example, if you look at the KSP for the calcium sulfite, which would be the calcium mixed in with this sulfite, that's a number much less than one, and that means you're gonna see a solid. But calcium mixed with sulfate, the other piece, also has a KSP much less than one. So both of these are gonna make solids pretty readily. But in theory, if we added the calcium in small enough increments, one of them would precipitate before the other one. And this question is basically asking that, which will precipitate first, the calcium sulfite or the calcium sulfate? So see if you can make even a guess which one you think would be the first one to precipitate, i.e. which one is uh, going to make a solid before the other one does, if you add the calcium in small enough values.
So there's two ways to solve this problem. Let's talk about the easier one first. If the ratio of the cation to anion is the same in both species, and they are here, all right, then the solubility, like we saw earlier, would be just the square root of Ksb. But what that also means is that you do the same process to both of these numbers to get the solubility. So if we're looking for the one to precipitate first, we want the smallest solubility, all right? And smallest solubility will come from the smallest Ksp. So the quick way to do this is literally to just look at the Ksps. And the smaller Ksp will give you the smallest solubility. That means that one will precipitate first. So without doing any math, you can just literally look at the KSPs. And more often than not, not 100%, but pretty close to 100%, smaller KSP will be the first one to precipitate. So CaSO3 is smaller than CaSO4, that would be really good. Now, Alfonso says, screw this, Russell. I don't want any of this uh, hand-waving crap. I want to do some math. Yeah! Alfonso, man after my own heart. What you can do, too, is literally calculate the amount of calcium needed to make a solid form. So for both of these compounds up here, KSP, this number, would equal calcium times whatever the sulfate or sulfite is. So right here, this is where you could do the actual amount. I'm solving for the calcium ion concentration. So for calcium sulfite, I took this number, I divided it by the concentration of the sulfite. It's going to take 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter calcium to make solid calcium sulfite appear. If you do the same thing with calcium sulfate, and look, I use the KSP right there, and this is the sulfate concentration. Eight times 10 to the minus five molar calcium is needed. This number is a couple orders of magnitude smaller than this one, so that's why this one will precipitate first. It takes less calcium to make a solid. It takes more calcium here to make a solid than it does for this one right here. So either of those answers are great. Um, I'm going to use these numbers on the next slide, so I'm just letting you know. But really, in this problem, you could literally just look at KSP. Smaller KSP needs precipitate first. On the other hand, if you want to really verify it, and there's nothing wrong with that, you can solve for the actual amount you're adding. Let's see. Any questions? Most of these questions are followed by a second question. So in this question, it says, all right, calcium sulfite is precipitating first. All right, no problem. Then it asks, okay, what is the concentration of the sulfite as the calcium sulfate begins to precipitate? Now, why this is cool for chemists is that in the last slide, we figured out that calcium sulfite makes a solid first. Well, as you start adding in calcium, all right, the CaSO3 makes a solid, and you can filter the calcium sulfite or decant or whatever. You can take the sulfite out of the solution. So this number, the 0 0.10 number, is going to start decreasing as the solid's made. So the question is here, how much of this sulfite is left when the calcium sulfate begins to precipitate? So what's going to happen mathematically? You're going to use the calcium from the last problem with the calcium sulfate example, the bigger number of calcium. And you're going to put it back in the KSP expression here for CaSO3. So it's like KSP, CaSO3 divided by the calcium from over here is going to give you a number of sulfite which should be less than 0.10. So see if you can do this. Uh, I'll show you how the math works here in a little bit. It's not hard mathematically, but sometimes getting the pieces together can be a little bit weird. So, so do the best you can. We'll talk about it here in a little bit.
there have been counseling numbers from the last call. So. Yes, sir. Anybody one more time on this problem? Okay. So in the last problem, we found that the calcium needed to make the calcium sulfite precipitate was quite a bit less than the calcium needed to make the calcium sulfate precipitate. 
And at first we just looked at these numbers, smaller means precipitate first. We got these numbers by taking these KSPs and dividing by the appropriate amount. So like this one we divided by the sulfite, 0.1, and this one we divided by 0.3. <clears throat> this new part says that, okay, we added 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7th molar. This one wasn't a solid yet because it need, we need more of it. But once you get to this point, you start seeing solid calcium sulfate precipitate. So we're raising the calcium until we're just maybe like a little short of this number, like maybe 7.9 times 10 to the minus 5, all right? And the question is, how much of the sulfite is left? Now, sulfite was 0 0.10 moles per liter. So this new part says, how much of this is left? Because as the solid forms, then the sulfite concentration goes down. So the number we're going to calculate will be a number less than 0 0.10, all right? Now, mathematically, this isn't a hard problem to do. You take the calcium from the calcium sulfate, this number, and the KSP from the least soluble part, which in this case is calcium sulfite. So we're going to take this number, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 8, and divide it by 8.0 times 10 to the minus 5. It's like KSP equals calcium times sulfite, and we're going to solve for sulfite. When you do that, you get 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4. All right? So again, this is the calcium ion concentration from before. And we're using it down here, but we're using it in the KSP for the calcium sulfite, or 1.3 times 10 to the minus 8. And the number that pops up, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4, is kind of a cool moment for chemists. Because in this, in this solution, which was 0 0.10 and 0 0.30, now the new solution is still about 0 0.30 moles per liter sulfate, but we have 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 sulfite. So sulfite has went down about three orders of magnitude, from 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 4. And that's when chemists get excited, because we've separated those ions. Now, that doesn't mean we went made the sulfite go to zero, all right? This is obviously a lot bigger than zero, but it's, many, it's several orders of magnitude less. And for a chemist, that's a separation most of the time. Now, you should still be aware that you don't got rid of the sulfite, it's just a lot less. So if you're doing something that's sulfite sensitive, you might want to think about other ways to make that number go even less. But at least in this case, we got it down several orders of magnitude. So. Any questions on that? Uh, there's a question like this in the solubility guide, which was one of the handouts from this section. Um, it goes through some examples of how KSP and solubility work and stuff like that. Okay. This next question is figuring out the pH of a saturated magnesium hydroxide solution. This has a KSP. Now in this problem, you don't know anything about concentrations of strong base, strong acid, blah, 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 all right? But from KSP, you can find hydroxide, and from hydroxide, you can find pH. So see if you can figure this out. What I would do here is I'd first solve for solubility X. Think about how solubility and hydroxide are related. And from hydroxide, then you can use 14 plus log hydroxide to find pH. So see if you can figure out what that value is.
So this problem, magnesium hydroxide, the solid is breaking down to magnesium and two hydroxides. This is another two to one ratio system. So in this case, we have two anions and one cation. So because of x and 2x, and you square the 2x, this will be a KSP equals 4x cubed system. So what I would do is I'd first solve for the solubility x. I'll take this number, divide it by 4, and raise it to the 1 3rd power. A cubed root is the same as raising something to the 1 3rd power. That will give me solubility x, but it won't give me hydroxide. Hydroxide is twice the solubility. So we'll multiply it by 2 to get the OH minus, and then using your method du jour, you can turn hydroxide into pH. So if you do this, it comes out to be 10.35. So here's the different math, 4x cubed equals KSP. So if you take that KSP and divide it by 4 and raise it to the 1 3rd power, which is like caret to the 1 3rd in parentheses, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4. And hydroxide is twice that number, so 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4. And then what I did here is I first found hydronium, so Kw, 10 to the minus 14, divided by hydroxide gives you hydronium, pH minus log of hydronium. But you could have also went 14 plus log of hydroxide at this point. That should have given you the same number both ways. Remember that this is something with hydroxide, and hydroxide is a base. So you wouldn't expect an acidic pH, so answer A and D would be silly here. Um, B is probably not basic enough, but you could either, you could at least narrow it down here a couple of choices by realizing that, yeah, bases have pHs greater than 7, acids have pHs less than 7. So. Any questions? In our lab with calcium hydroxide, um, we found hydroxide from the titration and then backtracked to two solubility by basically dividing by two. So here we went the opposite direction. We start with solubility, multiply by two to get the hydroxide, but same process, same idea. This one, we have uh, two compounds we're adding together, some lead 2 plus and some chloride. And earlier, we saw how lead and chloride, when they come together, they will make solids. But in the previous example, we had one mole per liter, which were pretty big numbers. Here, we have numbers, concentrations that are less than one. The KSP for lead 2 chloride uh, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5. So the question is, will you see a solid? Yes or no? You can absolutely guess, which is fine. Uh, but you should, there's a better way to do it. What I would do in this problem is I would solve for Q. Q looks the same as K. But you can compare then Q to this K. If Q is greater than KSP, a solid forms. If Q is less than KSP, you don't see a solid form. So think about all of that, and then we'll talk about uh, ways to get this out here.
kind of two. Is that a thing? Yeah. Okay. Is everybody cool if I start with this problem that they're still working on? Okay. Yeah. So Q, more than a Star Trek character, if you know about that. If you don't, you're better equipped than I. But anyway, Q is what I would do with this problem, John. It absolutely can. So in this reaction, lead two chloride, breaking down to lead plus two chlorides, and KSP, if you were right it, lead two plus times chloride ion squared because of the two, and solids and liquids kept out, all right? There's a couple different ways to do this problem, and you don't have to use Q if you don't want to, but Q would also equal the lead two plus times the chloride ion squared. So I would take this number and multiply it by this number squared. And whatever you get out, compare that Q to K. And if Q is less than KSP, no solid forms. If Q is greater than KSP, then you do see a solid. Now this number is not very big, all right? So it's gonna be relatively easy to see a, a solid. But that being said, these solutions aren't super concentrated either. So it's a little bit more vague here. So the way I would do it again, solve for Q, and when you do that, K lead times chloride squared, you get 1.2 times 10 to the minus 7. Now this is the Q value, and that Q is less than KSP, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5. So in this case, because Q is less than K, no solid forms. Now, uh, Daisy says, I don't want to do it that way. I'm going to take KSP, which is this number, and say divide by the chloride ion squared. That's cool. She'll calculate a certain amount of lead that's needed to make the solid form. And I don't know what that number is, but I'll guarantee you that this number is not bigger than that number. All right, that would be an alternative way. You can find the threshold, in this case like lead, to make the precipitate happen. And whatever that number is, uh, it's going to be a number bigger than this. We don't have enough lead to make a thing. And Alfonso could do the same thing for chloride. All right, He could take KSB divided by lead, square root of that. That would tell you the chloride needed. And that number, whatever it is, would be bigger than this number right here. So pick whatever way you want. Man. It's cool. um, in the lab, we didn't do because of snow, which I still can't believe happened during spring term. But anyway, that was Le Chalet's principle. And the first question, we were mixing lead and chloride together, and the solid forms really easily. But uh, you have to have a certain concentration around it. And in this case, we just don't have those concentrations. Any questions on that? OK. Here's a question uh, which kind of uh, straddles different things. It says, which one, of these questions, which one of these reactions represents the formation constant equation for the complex ion, which is this thing right here? We now know, by the way, this is hexacyanochromium 3 ion, or chromate, I should say, 3 ion, because it's part of the negative ion, but that's not neither here nor there. The real question here is, what is a KF expression? Now, KSPs, the solid is the reactant, and the ions that go into it are products. I want you to think about what a KF means, and it's kind of similar to this, but there are some changes. So see if you can figure out which one of these here would be like the best example of a KF expression.
On the last problem, we had a KSP for lead to chloride. And when people say KSP for lead to chloride, that automatically tells the hip chemist that the lead to chloride as a solid will be the reactant, and the ions that go into it will be the product. So in this case, lead to plus and two chlorides. KFs, though, for like this one right here, are a little bit different. The KF exciting part, which is the CrCn6 minus 3 thing, that's going to be the product. So in the KF expression, we would write CrCn6 minus 3 as the product. It's not the reactant like it was for the KSP. But like KSP, anything that goes into making the complex ion, those are going to be the reactants. So for this case, we would have a chromium plus three and six cyanides. And these are all water soluble or aqueous things because of that. So KF expressions, the complex ion is the product, which is different than KSPs. KSPs, those parts were the reactant. From KF, it's the opposite. But like KSP, anything that goes into making the complex ion, those are going to be your reactants. So there's some examples like here of sodium and stuff like that. No, don't put any sodium, because maybe it was potassium, we don't know. But you do know that the CrCn minus three thing has six cyanides. Cyanide is negative one. And because there's six of them and a negative three, that means this is a chromium plus three. Anything that has a charge cannot be a solid. And so answer C right here is especially because it, negative three things can't be solved. Like you could put potassium, sodium, lithium, ammonium, something else to balance it, but some things with charge cannot be solids or liquids. Sometimes they can be gas phase, that's kind of a specialty thing, but uh, that one is especially wrong. Any questions on that? Shifting gears now, this is an entropy question, and it says to calculate the entropy change for this reaction. Um, when you see a problem like this, a uh, couple of things about entropy. First of all, entropy values are never zero or negative. Zero is only for those perfect Kelvin crystals, zero Kelvin crystals, which is like never, and negative doesn't happen at all. Um, other thing is that to figure these things out, it's always products minus reactants. So using these values and this equation, see if you can find the delta S, the change in entropy for this reaction, using those numbers right there.
for touring. <laughs> Do you know where that comes from? Uh, well done. Hey, check this guy to the galaxy. Well done, man. Yeah. They, uh, if you don't know, and you don't have to raise your hand, um, these beings who created the supercomputer to answer what is the meaning of life, and like generations later, then the computer comes back and says 42. <laughs> so the question was not specific. Is anybody still working on this? It's totally cool. All right. So products minus reactants. You have to have a table. Uh, use the values that are given and stuff. Don't use Google values because your answers would be strange. But anyway, uh, products, these guys minus these guys. So it would be carbon dioxide plus 2 times chlorine. All of these are per mole. So because there's a 2 right there, you would multiply the chlorine number by 2. But then you subtract the CCL4 and the O2. So when you go through all the math, it comes out to be 240.44 joules per Kelvin, all right, which is no big deal. Um, sometimes you can make sense of the answer. Uh, this is an increase in entropy. And knowing that entropy is about disorder, Entropy loves gases more than liquids. So in this problem, one reason why delta S is positive is one of the liquids goes away and you have gases. Anytime you can make gases from liquids or solids, you've got to increase entropy. The other thing, though, that's cool entropy-wise here is you're going from two moles of reactant to three moles of product. So that's another way to show that the entropy, the disorder, is increasing. So for both of these reasons, this is a very positive delta S, all right? Delta S is definitely taking care of business here. And 42 is not the answer. Darn it. <laughs> Any questions? All right. This problem, I'm just going to show you the answer. I'm not going to do it. But this is the same kind of problem, but with delta G. So basically, a very similar reaction. It's delta G of products minus delta G of reactants. You have to use a table. Now, I didn't put the delta G for O2 up there because I wanted to talk about this problem that the elements in their standard states have delta G and delta H values of zero. So you don't need the delta G of O2 to do this problem. It's equal to zero, and the same with delta H. So if you go through this, it comes out to be a negative 800.8 joules per Kelvin. Making CO2 and water is very spontaneous. It happens. All this, all the uh, combustion reactions we've talked about, very spontaneous. And this is what you use if you have natural gas on your stove valve. Right? It just goes like crazy. It's also bad because it creates CO2, but that's neither here nor there. Um, questions on this problem? All right. <clears throat> Now, for this problem, uh, this is a, we should do this problem. All right, so yeah, figure this one out. So this one, you're given delta H and delta S, and the question is find delta G. This is probably the most important way uh, that people can find uh, delta G values of all time. There's a couple of small little tricks in there, so just uh, go through it.
running out of time, so my apologies about that. Keep going here. Uh, this is what they using what's called the Gibbs equation, which is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Uh, a couple of things. Turn your Celsius into Kelvin, so 25 is 298. And the second thing is that remember that delta H and delta S are usually different units. Delta H, like delta G, is usually kilojoules, but S is usually in joules. So when you add the T delta S term to the delta H term, make sure you're using kilojoules and kilojoules, or, or joules and joules. But if you did it correctly, this comes out to be answer B, the negative 568 number. De negative delta G's means spontaneous. That means this reaction is going to go. And it's going to go not because of entropy. This is not entropy favored. Positive delta S's are entropy favored. Negative delta S means this reaction entropy is not in favor of. But delta H, when it's negative, means that it's enthalpy favored. This is an exothermic reaction. And exothermic reactions do want the reaction to occur. So a negative delta H helps make this delta G negative. That's why we call this enthalpy favored reaction, but it's not entropy favored. Any questions on that? Okay. As a quick reminder, this entire lecture is the complete lecture review for midterm two, stuff like that. So you can go back and look at this stuff in more detail. Um, this is a question that's kind of fun to think about. We have a positive delta H and a positive delta S, and it says what can be said about this reaction? Well, positive delta S means entropy favored, but positive delta H means enthalpy disfavored. Enthalpy doesn't want this reaction to go. So in this reaction, when the T delta S term overpowers delta H, that will make this reaction spontaneous. Delta S wants delta G to be negative, but positive delta H does not want it. So for this reaction, we would say that high temperatures would favor this reaction. We could make this occur when the T delta S term is bigger than delta H. Remember, up until Chem 223, every time there was exothermic, i.e. negative delta H's, we said the reaction occurs. Now we know it's a little bit more. Uh, this is a question, same kind of problem, delta H, delta S, find delta G. In this problem, you want to find delta H first, products minus reactants, find delta S, products minus reactants, and then combine them to find delta G. It's a lot of math, but it's all stuff you can do. Make sure you turn joules to kilojoules, stuff like that before. Make sure you use Kelvin temperatures, not Celsius. Um, here's a problem. We have an exothermic reaction, negative delta H, but also a negative delta S. And it says what uh, happens when you increase the temperature, i.e., when does the reaction become non-spontaneous? So first of all, because the signs of delta H and delta S are the same, temperature is going to have a play. If delta H was negative and this was positive, or vice versa, then you'll have one of the cases where it's always spontaneous or always non-spontaneous. But in this case, you've got both of them negative. So temperature is going to be important here. So when you solve for the temperature, let delta G be zero. So delta H equals T delta S, and you can solve for T. In this case, the temperature that pops out, 7620, above this temperature, that's when the reaction becomes positive delta G, non-spontaneous. If it's less than this number, then it will be spontaneous. You'll have negative delta G. This is kind of the opposite of what we did in problem set five. We did a problem where we wanted to figure out where the temperature became spontaneous. In this reaction, above this temperature, it's non-spontaneous. And then finally, this is just another KSP delta G kind of thing. Uh, delta G equals minus RT natural log of K. They give you KSP, you want to find delta G. All right. R is the 8.3145 number that we've used a lot, Kelvin temperature. The number comes out initially pretty big. People usually turn it into kilojoules and stuff, and we're good to go. I don't have time to do the electrochemistry stuff, sorry about that, but again, the complete lecture will go over all of that, and you can ask me questions by email. Any questions, anything? Have a wonderful day.